So I'll be talking about current hunter-gatherer diets today, um, and in particular I'll be talking about my work among the Hadza hunter-gatherers of Tanzania and East Africa. So the first question that we want to ask is, why study hunter-gatherer diets? So as, as you'll see today, um, there is a wide breadth of data that we'll be covering, and um, I'm responsible for, for um, it's, a, it's a very ambitious thing to try to do is to, to discuss hunter-gatherer diets, so I'm going to do a very brief overview of why we're looking at hunter-gatherer diet composition and then situate it within the context of the, the symposium today. So all humans share a suite of dietary traits that have been retained over millennia of natural selection um, because of their survival value. Now how this is operationalized in different populations um, is very different. So you see a lot of variation which we're going to talk about momentarily. Studying hunter-gatherer diets provide a window by which to view the evolution of the human diet. So hunter-gatherers, I want to say right now before we move forward, um, are not living fossils. They are contemporary modern populations just like you and I. What makes hunter-gatherers interesting and so relevant for discussions like today is that they practice a subsistence regime that has characterized much of human evolutionary history. And the Hadza in particular, who we'll talk about, the population I work with, live in an area of East Africa that has been characterized by many anthropologists as the crucible of human evolution. So this area um, in which our ancestors evolved. So the fact that they're living this nomadic hunting and gathering lifestyle in an area in which our ancestors did, did evolve and are targeting similar food sources means that they can provide a plausible window into the past. Um, now, of course, there are a lot of caveats on this, which we will talk about further, such as many hunter-gatherer populations today are living in marginalized populations, they're living in marginalized areas of their ancestral territory. In addition, as we will see, they're supplementing their diet with traded and purchased foods as well. So again, um, not living fossils, but definitely a allow us to make plausible predictions. And this becomes increasingly important um, as the Paleolithic diet is uh, ever popular, as Dr. Aiello has shown us. So we're still debating on what this Paleolithic diet consists of. Changes in diet um, composition approximately 2.5 million years ago have been linked with the evolution of many uh, hominin traits, so the hallmarks of human evolution, including the sexual division of labor, prosociality, pair bonding, um, and even family formation. So diet is a smoking gun um, in a lot of these scenarios, and it's important when we start thinking about diet composition, and we place so much emphasis on forager diets and what contemporary foragers are eating in this comparative context, to, to think about the breadth and variety. So hunter-gatherer populations from around the world exhibit a wide range of nutritional patterns. So there is no one hunter-gatherer diet, and I think that's one of my take-home messages for today. Uh, they vary according to availability of plant and animal resources. In some coastal areas, you see a lot of fish and shellfish providing significant proportions of the diet, and um, marine resources are um, finally receiving the attention I think that they've deserved. So we're starting to, to really focus more um, on different types of foods rather than the, the age-old debate, the, the meat versus potato debate, which we'll get into. So meat versus tubers as um, the foods in human evolution. In many circumpolar environments, you see higher amounts of meat consumption. This too is starting to change uh, as we're getting more nuanced data from Arctic foraging populations. And in fact, some very exciting data is coming out of Yupik hunter-gatherers um, in Alaska, who it turns out might actually be fermenting plant foods um, in the bodies of seals and storing this plant food throughout the year to use for later. So even our assumptions about um, how Arctic foragers kind of ruin the, the sample of hunter-gatherers. So you have a lot of subtropical foragers and then all of a sudden you have Arctic foragers who are eating all sorts of meat, which kind of right, makes, this, makes the story difficult if we're trying to find universals. Turns out they too are eating plant food. Um, it just might be hiding in, in the stomachs, uh, stomachs of seals <laughs> um, throughout certain seasons. Um, in many subtropical environments, you have an approximate plant to animal subsistence ratio, which is about 50-50, and in many populations, you actually see higher plant contributions to diet, so more plants being consumed um, than meat products. So you can see modern hunter-gatherers right here are these little peach-colored circles, so not very many populations left, um, and this is the area which we're going to be moving into. So today I'm going to report um, diet composition data for the Hadza foragers of Tanzania. Um, I'm going to do some nutritional chemistry results here. We're going to actually talk about nutrient composition, fat, protein, sugar, fiber, and energy for plant foods. I'll tell you why this is important and why you should care about these in a moment. Um, the percent of contribution to diet by food type, comparison and discussion of some of the big foods, meat, tubers, and honey, 
and implications for models of the evolution of the hominin diet. So what Hadza dietary reconstruction can tell us about human evolution, what we should take away. I've worked among the Hadza since 2004. Um, diet composition and nutrition in general is one of my research foci. I'm particularly interested in the ways in which food acquisition, foraging behavior, and food distribution um, affect many parameters of social behavior. And I'm interested in the evolution of how all of these things come together to tell the human story. Today we're going to be talking about diet exclusively. Um, and diet is very important because diet has, again, as I said before, been implicated with all of these social behaviors and these changes in human evolution. So let's get a handle on what we're talking about. So first I'll give you a background into the Hadza. The Hadza, um, there's approximately 1,000 individuals who identify as Hadza. Of these 1,000 individuals, approximately 300 hunt and gather. I go back and forth because every year that I go back, the number is declining. So um, this summer, as of this summer, it was a little over 200, um, but we still have many who are practicing hunting and gathering for a substantial portion of their diet. So um, we'll leave the number at 300 for now, but it's on the decline. The data that you'll see today um, were taken from camps in which uh, they were collecting over 90% of their food from, 90% um, of their diet from wild foods. So there are many Hadza that are living in the villages or on the periphery of villages, and they have a, a much more mixed subsistence regime. They live in northern Tanzania on the shores of the alkaline Lake, La Lake Yasi. Camp membership is very fluid and as we'll see momentarily, really changes, um, changes composition in terms of seasonality. So wet season composition and dry season composition are very different and this has substantial effects on diet composition. Um, and diet composition in turn has substantial effects on social relationships and social arrangement and camp composition during this time. Camp size um, does fluctuate with seasonality and we'll see that. Here's just a quick um, a quick view of the field site. So this is Lake Yasi, and the research area that I tend to focus on is on the west side of Lake Yasi, although I have done work on the east side, but today exclusively we'll be talking about camps that are on the east side of the lake. It is just south of the Serengeti National Park, those of you that are familiar with the Serengeti. Um, here's just a quick snapshot of some of the foods, and we'll be talking about each of these in turn today before we get into um, how important they are for the diet and one thing that I'd like to introduce before we actually get into the methods is that many studies of hunter-gatherer diets have been um, up until very recently largely anecdotal. The other issue is that you have um, very different methods being used both in the field and in the lab in order to measure this stuff. So you can have data that's reported in things like calories, kilocalories, kilojoules, um, wet weight kilograms, dry weight kilograms, right, which makes it, as you might imagine, very difficult to do any comparisons across populations. You also have difference in terms of nutritional um, laboratory methodology, so what's happening in the lab as you analyze these foods. Um, this is a problem for those of us that are trying to figure out what hunter-gatherer diets can tell us. So what I decided to do is um, go out and collect these foods and bring them back to the Nutritional Ecology Laboratory at Harvard University and Dr. Rangham, who we'll be hearing from later today, um, and Nancy Lou Conklin Britton very graciously allowed me to use the lab to analyze all of these wild foods. Um, no commercial nutrition lab in the US would take the samples when I was doing my dissertation work. So Dr. Rangham said, that's okay, bring them in. Um, and we did, and we found some, some very interesting results that we'll get into. So we're going to be talking about many different berry species, tuber species, which are underground storage organs. I always describe them, um, they often get likened to a potato, but I find that they're much more similar to jicama um, or even a water chestnut, if that, if that helps, although they're incredibly fibrous, um, which has interesting implications for microbiota and what's happening with all of the, the gut populations to break this stuff down. Baobab fruit, we'll be talking about honey. Um, figs are also a very important part of the diet, especially for children, um, and legumes and nut species as well, and we'll get into meat, which includes a lot of avian species, which often get overlooked in a lot of dietary reconstructions. Birds are very important for most uh, hunter-gatherer populations, particularly subtropical foragers, so it's important to keep how, uh, birds in mind. So very quickly, going through different food sources, baobab fruit, this is what it looks like when you open it up. Um, it has a hard shell, and inside you have all of these um, very, you have seeds that are covered in kind of a chalky white powder. Baobab fruit is consumed in several different ways. Here we have a picture of a mother pounding baobab seeds. 
the most common way is to take this is to take the innards out, take a pounding rock, pound it into a powder, and then winnow, winnow the powder. So what that means is that you have access now to the lipid-rich seed inside. So once you winnow this powder, uh, what happens? They, they use a they use a piece of animal hide. Is the seed husk floats away. So what you're left with is the fruit powder as well as the powder from the seed. Um, it can also be mixed with berry juice to make um, a Hadza smoothie, which is a really good weaning food. We have several different types um, of berry species. I just have three here, but there are about six species that are routinely consumed. Um, this is on a berry foray. I had one of my friends just show me the, the very small amount that she trotted home with to feed the three hungry mouths that were waiting, and then she came back to get a much bigger yield. Um, several different berry species. And tubers, um, tubers are pretty famous and they keep showing up in terms of many models of human evolution and, and models of the evolution of the human diet. The Hadza consume four species routinely. They're shown on this slide. And Equa, which is this species right, this species right here, um, is a, a very fibrous species and, and one um, that is appears a lot in the literature um, as a very important tuber and a very important either staple part of the Hadza diet or a fallback food. There's still a lot of discussion on, on the role of tubers, but what we can agree on is that tubers do make an appearance routinely in a lot of these models, so they deserve our attention. One of the things that makes tubers so interesting is that they can often be buried um, up to four to five feet in the ground. So women, Hadza women tend to forage in groups, Hadza men hunt. Uh, typically solo, sometimes in pairs. And um, tubers, as we now know, based on mounting evidence, can be consumed, uh, they can be collected throughout the year, both in the rainy season and in the dry season. And it's, it can be very backbreaking work, as you see here. And I love this photo because this woman has an, a sleeping infant on her back as she's practically uprooting a tree to get to a tuber. So I, don't, I still don't know how she stayed asleep. But here, this is what a typical tuber collection looks like. We will be getting back to the importance of fire, both in this talk and subsequent talks. Um, Hadza women tend to roast their tubers, and they do kind of a flash fire roasting. This is a tuber species called makalita, um, that's the Hadza word for it, and they, they will roast them uh, typically for just a few minutes before they pull them off the fire to consume them. Honeycomb um, and bee larva. So honey, liquid honey and bee larva are a very important part of the Hadza diet. Honey, interestingly enough, is routinely ranked by men, women, and children as the number one Hadza food item. It ranks above meat. Um, so for many of the models of human evolution that, that place meat kind of as the pinnacle food, it's very interesting that to many foraging populations, honey is actually the number one food that they would like to consume. Um, Hadza men have a very interesting relationship with the honey guide bird, which I think we'll hear more about today from Dr. Rangham. Um, one of my favorite factoids about the honey guide bird is their Latin name is Indicator Indicator. And the Hadza have this great symbiotic relationship with this bird. The bird um, tweets, starts chattering and whistling to the Hadza honey guide, a Hadza honey hunter who's out foraging, and he will then respond back. So there's this series of chatters and whistles that goes back and forth until the bird leads the hunter to the hive. And they then hammer these pegs into the base of the tree. They climb up to the top, they smoke the hive. They hack into it first with an ax, which is very brutal, difficult work, smoke the hive, and then extract the honeycomb. They leave with their prize, and the honey guide bird, um, not to be forgotten, will feast on the wax and the bee carcasses. And they don't always smoke the hive, but they do routinely smoke the hive. Um, Hadza men say only, I, I asked a man during an interview last summer, and he said, well, only the really crazy ones will go after a big hive without smoking it. And this is what a really big hive looks like. So <laughs> um, that's, that's a lot of smoke needed for a very big hive. So you can see we're not talking about small amounts of honey. Um, depending on the region and depending on the season, we're talking about a lot of honey consumption. So it's a very important food. And we can't forget meat. Can't forget meat. Um, meat is also important in the Hadza diet. Okay, so let's get into the actual nutritional composition. So I took, I took food samples in the field, um, I dried them, I took all their measurements, and then I dutifully carried them back to the laboratory um, and analyzed them for nutritional composition. So turns out honey ends up being low in protein and fat. We did not include larvae for permitting issues. 
Um, we're hoping to be able to um, amend that and collect larva and actually take it out of the country because um, if you think about it, it's a very important component of honeycomb. Um, high in mono and disaccharides. Baobab is high in protein for the flower, um, fat in the seeds and fiber, and low in the mono and disaccharides. Berries are low in fat, relatively low in protein, um, and as we might have predicted, high in both mono and disaccharides. Legumes are high in protein and fiber, low in fat and sugar. And figs are high in fat, fiber, mo and mono and disaccharides, but low in protein. Droops are high in fat and protein, and high in fiber and low in sugar. So what does this mean, once we have all of this information, right? What does this mean? Um, so for many early studies looking at hunter-gatherer diets, what would happen is anthropologists would take measurements of food coming back into camp. So they would look at wet weight. So you would basically measure the weight of the food coming back in, and then you'd get proportionality studies. So you'd say, okay, the weight, we have this much weight of meat versus this much weight of tubers versus this much weight of berries, right? which is interesting in terms of proportionality, um, but not helpful when we're thinking about energetic contribution to the diet. Not helpful when we're thinking about particular, uh, both micro and macronutrients. So what we need to do is get energetic value so that we can find out what these foods are telling us. So if you have a kilogram of meat and a kilogram of figs, you're not talking about the same food, right? You're simply reporting weight. So I decided, okay, we need to get in there and actually find, um, find the nutritional value. There were several previous studies done on Hadza diet, and this one was a very, uh, it was, we decided that it actually turned out to be fantastic because we used the new um, methods and we came up with values that were actually um, kind of right in range of the previous values. So you can see honey, baobab, berries, figs, legumes, and tubers. So what does the Hadza diet look like? So total calories, you can see here, this is what it looks like for the year. And before I wind down, I want to show you what the seasonal differences look like because this is where it's really interesting and something that often gets left out of many models of human evolution. So if you look at total kilocalories by food type, you see purchased, meat, honey, fruits, nuts, legumes, and tubers. If you go by season, you see we have, in the wet season, a lot more plant matter being consumed as opposed to the dry season, where you have a lot more meat being consumed as everybody, including animals, is hovering around the watering holes, which makes them easier to hunt. So what this means um, for models of human evolution when we're looking at hunter-gatherer diets is we need to be much more inclusive. So we need to start looking at greater dietary breadth. It is not just about meat versus tubers, um, we also need to include many other different types of foods when we're thinking about this. And this is one take home message from the Hadza and hunter-gatherer diets in general, is to really pay attention to local ecological variability and what this means in terms of being omnivores. Thank you.